Good morning, and uh, welcome to worship on this All Saints Day. Uh, next Sunday, as you know, is Remembrance Sunday, and so the service will begin at the earlier time of 10.50. And as usual, the young people of our youth organisations will contribute to the service, but they won't be here in person. We'll just see videos of them, but it'd be nice to at least have a contribution from them. And please don't, um, if, you, if you want to come to church any Sunday, I know we said, you know, it, maybe take a week off. Just let Douglas know that you want to come, and the worst that will happen is you'll be put on a waiting list. So don't, don't hold back. <laughs> and Douglas will uh, keep, this, keep people, um, deal fairly with people. See what the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has yet to be revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Let us worship God in our opening hymn, Behold the Amazing Gift of Love. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us your children, not because anything we have done to deserve that title, but solely through the grace of your abiding love. Father, however hard we may try, we can never entirely live up to the honour you have bestowed on us in giving us a special place in your heart. But what we can do is offer you our worship. What we can do is offer you our praise. What we can do is to seek to do what is right in your sight. And so we've come today, as we come week by week, to freely offer you our worship, to sing your praises, to listen for your word and to renew our determination to become worthy of your grace and mercy. Loving God, during these past seven months, our lives and the lives of all human beings on earth have become restricted in ways we could never have imagined. We are in a state of war with an enemy that is unseen, 
but whose presence and activity among all of us causes fear and cannot be ignored. In such a situation, we sometimes wonder where you are in all of this. We wonder if you truly do care for us. We wonder if you have sent this plague to punish us, just as you sent plagues to the Egyptians all those millennia ago. We may wonder if you are angry with us. We may wonder what we must do to restore balance in our world and to defeat this invisible enemy. Yet, in our wondering, we know in our hearts that regardless of where and how this virus came into being, it has been spread by human carelessness human selfishness, human pride that makes some assume they are somehow immune. We recognize that this second wave that is affecting all countries might have been avoided had every one of us obeyed instructions and cared as much for others as we do for ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for our failure to take responsibility for our own lives and for the lives of others. Remind us that although you love us freely, you require of us obedience, righteousness, concern for our fellow humans and for our planet. Above all, Lord, we pray that you would remind us daily of your presence giving us the strength to place our whole trust in you, to have faith that there will be a better and safer future for the world, and that the responsibility for thus does not rest only with you, but that each and every one of us has a part to play. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and let our cries come unto you. For we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Our first reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, reading verses 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's now reflect on the words of the hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues.
Our second reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter him, them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherds, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. Our next hymn is Ye Servants of God. Thank you. Lord, as we come to your word, open it to us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Matthew's gospel was written for the Jews. It was written by a Jew. 
in order to convince the Jews that, of Jesus' status as Messiah. And in order to do this, he wanted to demonstrate that the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. As we know, Jesus often criticized the scribes and the Pharisees for their emphasis on the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. Yet we also know that Jesus came, claimed to have come into the world not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, according to a Hebrew scholar I was listening to recently, Matthew's use of the word fulfill reflects a Hebrew word meaning to perform or to uphold. That scholar believes that in this context, Jesus was reenacting the law, redoing history. And thinking about the Sermon on the Mount in that way helps us as non-Jews to make connections with the Old Testament. For example, like Moses, Jesus escaped murder as an infant. Like Moses, he went down to Egypt. And like Moses, Jesus was brought back from Egypt. And in going up a mountain to deliver his sermon, what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus echoes Moses going up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. In contrast to Moses, though, Jesus delivers not commandments as such, but what we refer to as the Beatitudes. In a sense, though, the Beatitudes could be seen as commandments. And if we look carefully at Matthew verses 5, verses 3 to 12, we can identify 10 Beatitudes. Here's a reminder. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Beatitudes could be understood as a summary of all Jesus' teaching. They were delivered not long after the calling of the first disciples and could be seen as Jesus' teaching of his disciples, teaching what he wished them to pass on to others, teaching that for us, his latter day disciples, also needs to be understood and shared. In Hebrew, the words blessed are translates as, oh, the blessedness of. It can also be translated as happy, which is the word the Good News Bible uses. But we puzzle over these concepts, don't we? We puzzle over how on earth people in the situations mentioned in the Beatitudes could be described as blessed or happy. It makes no sense, does it? Or does it? Are the Beatitudes, in effect, a list of Ten Commandments? Perhaps these blessings or so-called happy events are pointing us towards faith and how we live out our faith. So let's think about that notion in relation to some of the Beatitudes. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now here, Jesus isn't advocating that poverty is a blessed situation. Far from it, he urged his followers to look after the poor. I think in this beatitude, Jesus is suggesting that if we have no earthly resources, physical or spiritual, if we recognize our utter helplessness, there is no other option but to put our trust in God. I'm reminded of a phrase I heard many years ago, I've been so down, everything looks up to me. So perhaps it's only when we are at our lowest ebb, poor in spirit, that we can begin to truly rely on God rather than ourselves. When things are going well for us, it can be easy to become detached from God. Maybe we don't feel the need of him at these times. But when the going gets tough, often that is when we remember God. Remember to invite him into our lives once more. Become attached to him once more. So we could translate this beatitude as, blessed are those who have realized their own utter helplessness and who have put their whole trust in God. And the commandment here might be, put your whole trust in God. And how about blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth? Well, here we aren't thinking there's something joyful about being spineless or ineffectual, about being downtrodden or bullied. On the other hand, without a certain amount of humility, we can't learn. If we think we know it all, we're setting ourselves above God. So this beatitude is less about allowing ourselves to be controlled by others, and more about allowing us to be controlled by God. We might think the opposite of meekness might be anger and forcefulness, and there may be something in that. But the point here is to be angry at the right things, poverty, injustice, cruelty, for example, and to challenge these things in whichever way we can. That is how we work towards making the world a better place. So this commandment might be Obey God in all things. The next one I want to mention is blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Because this one has echoes of the prayer we repeat in church every week and possibly say daily as part of our own prayer life, what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And this beatitude, blessed are the merciful, echoes the phrase, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How often do we pause to think about that phrase? It would be easy to slide over this and take it as read that we always forgive those who offend us in some way. But is it really maybe saying something far more powerful Is it suggesting that we will be treated as we treat others? If we fail to forgive others, if we hold a grudge and forever rake up old grievances, we really cannot expect forgiveness for our own failings or our own sins, our own unkindness towards others. And alongside this is a hint that Rather than be angry or unforgiving when someone says or does something offensive to us, we perhaps need to try to put ourselves in their shoes. Try to understand what prompted their words or their actions. Try to empathize. 
which means trying to get in touch with their feelings rather than focusing on our own hurt feelings. So this one reminds us of one of Jesus' greatest commandments, treat others as you would like others to treat you. And how about blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God? Are any of us pure in heart? By that I mean, do we ever do a bit of self-examination? Do we stop to examine our motives for doing good things? As Christians in following Jesus' teaching about caring for others, are we really doing this out of a genuine desire to follow Jesus? Or are we meeting our own needs, making ourselves feel better? Maybe thinking we're earning brownie points in heaven for which we should be rewarded. We often worry about the number of people who have either never found God or, and Jesus or have rejected them. And often we criticize their lack of faith. Yet many non-Christians, indeed many atheists, are found to do good works without any sense of it being for God. For example, not all doctors and nurses have a religious faith, nor do all charity workers. They are people who care for others and do good works for no other reason than they, they see the needs of others and respond accordingly. They have no sense that they are fulfilling an obligation to a higher power. They are just genuinely kind caring and generous people. Will God ignore them because they lack faith? Or will God reward them ahead of those who are merely seeking to please him, hoping to be at the front of the queue at the pearly gates? And this reminds me of Jesus' command to take the log out of your own eye so you can see better to take the speck of dust out of your neighbor's eye. And then there is blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the sons of God. Now this beatitude is about peacemakers, not necessarily peace lovers. It isn't about being passive, giving in for the sake of peace, avoiding conflict of any kind. It isn't just about freedom for, from trouble. It's about an active tackling of tricky situations. It's about challenging situations we know to be real, wrong. It's about mediation, having the courage to try to rec reconcile warring parties makes me think of marriage guidance counselling, the art of trying to help two people understand their own behaviour and understand the other person's point of view. So even if two people or two groups or even two countries can't be completely reconciled, at least with appropriate intervention, a degree of peace and mutual respect can be restored. So the commandment here might be the other one that Jesus gave, the one we spoke about last week. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. By now you might be wondering if there's any point in being a Christian when so many non-believers might be rewarded every bit as much as we will be because they do good without having to think about this being a prerequisite of reward from a God they don't acknowledge. But take heart, the final two Beatitudes are, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven 
for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There are many countries in the world where people are persecuted for their Christian faith. Countries where people are forced to worship in secret for fear of being prosecuted or worse. North Korea, Pakistan, some African countries. And of course, it's only relatively recently that Christians in Russia became free to worship openly. We're very fortunate in Britain that there is religious freedom. But we do live with the threat of extremists attacking our way of life. And there are certainly times when we feel under attack for what we believe. Times when we're faced with the dilemma of whether to own up to our faith in the face of mockery. The dilemma that Peter faced when he denied Jesus three times. The dilemma that many of our young people face when they want to be in the cool crowd, the crowd who think it isn't cool to be a Christian. So these final two Beatitudes can perhaps be summed up in that other great commandment of Jesus, the one we heard last week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. Amen. Let's worship God in our offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have blessed us beyond our deserving. You have given us more than we could ever have dared to ask for, loving us with a love that refuses to count the cost, showering us with good things too many to number. Gracious God, for your gener generous and wonderful gifts, we praise you, and we bring this our offering as a token of our thanksgiving. And we bring to you also our prayers for others. Loving God, this past week has seen a huge resurgence of coronavirus throughout the world. The rate of infection has risen dramatically, and deaths have increased dramatically also. We lay before you our concerns for all those who have been affected by this situation, particularly those who have become ill and those who have lost loved ones. Comfort and strengthen them, Lord, and strengthen us, giving us all hope for the future. We uphold in prayer also the residents of the city in Turkey where an earthquake has destroyed many buildings, where people have been injured and some have lost their lives. We ask your blessing on members of this congregation who are in hospital at this time, those who are awaiting hospital appointments to discover the nature of conditions from which they are suffering, those who are ill at home, and their friends and relatives who are concerned for them. We ask your blessing too on the many people who have been unable to return to work since the start of this pandemic, those who have lost their jobs and with that their livelihoods those struggling to make ends meet, those facing poverty for the first time in their lives, and those already in poverty who 
who are now struggling even more than previously. Give politicians a heart for those in need so that the resources can be found to restore all to a reasonable standard of living. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We conclude our worship with the hymn for all the saints. go in peace to love and to serve God, and may the peace of God, which is beyond all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love and love of God today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. <laughs>